I want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Nick Marshall. I'm the head of exhibitions and programs at the George Eastman Museum. Uh, welcome to today's virtual in focus talk. Uh, I'm excited to welcome historian, educator, and curator Leslie K. Brown back to our in focus series. Uh, which was formerly known as Focus 45 when Leslie last spoke uh, in, 20, in 2016. Uh, Leslie gave uh, an in-person talk on the same topic of Kodak picture spots uh, to a fully packed audience in our theater. Uh, it was so well received that we wanted to bring her back to do an updated version of the talk uh, and extend it to our virtual audience as well. Uh, and this time, uh, we are going to record it so that we have it to share even more broadly on our YouTube page. Um, if you have any questions at any point throughout today's talk, please submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. At the end of Leslie's talk, we'll go through as many of your questions that we have time for. Uh, the chat function is open. Uh, I, I, it's hard to monitor that for questions though. So if you wanna use that to just drop a line, say hello, uh, please feel free to do that. But if you do have questions, do ask that you submit them through the Q&A button. Uh, and that should either be at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, depending on what device you're using to watch from. Uh, as I mentioned, we are recording today's webinar. We'll be putting it on our YouTube channel. That should be up in hopefully a week or so. Uh, you should receive a follow-up email once that goes live um, on YouTube. And uh, feel free to watch again, share with others. Um, you'll be able to access that along with our other video webinar content um, on our YouTube channel. I do have the closed captioning function on Zoom turned on, uh, but if you would like to turn it off, well, if, if you don't see it on your screen, uh, you can click the closed captioning icon uh, at the bottom and you should be able to turn it on or off either way, depending on if you want to have it on or not. Uh, and I do want to note that uh, Zoom's closed captioning is a great feature. Uh, sometimes it's, it, it has a difficult time with some of the interpretation, particularly some of the technical language specific, specific to photography. So uh, just a, a heads up there. Um, and, and one more thing of note, and I believe uh, Leslie's going to mention this, but this talk is in conjunction with our ex exhibition that's up in the historic mansion right now in the sitting room called uh, uh, George Eastman 100 years ago. Uh, and George Eastman and, and the, the exhibit, which was curated by Jesse Pierce, uh, exhibit, or um, sorry, the exhibit looks at what was going on around George Eastman in his life 100 years ago. This is an exhibition that we do on a yearly basis. Um, and part of uh, 1921 was the introduction of the Kodak picture spot. So um, I know Leslie's gonna talk a bit more about that. So uh, if you uh, are comfortable coming into the museum and you're in, in the area, uh, would definitely encourage you to, to come in and check out that exhibit. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Leslie. Leslie. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, and thank you for inviting me back. Uh, I'm coming to you actually right now from Cambridge, Massachusetts, which it is gray and rainy out, which makes me feel quite at home being from Rochester, New York. Um, just a few notes before I begin the talk. Uh, I have a very long history with the George Eastman Museum. I, um, I, over half of my life, uh, <laughs> I have been going there. But if you count even going with my father when I was a young child, even longer. Um, I did an internship at my senior year at SUNY Geneseo. Uh, I even remember a former curator, Therese Mulligan's uh, first day. I ended up doing my master's thesis um, on Ann Brigman and researched also at the East M Museum for that. Um, helped along with archivists David Wooters, Janice Madhu, and Joe Struble, all of whom have uh, since retired. Um, I'm also grateful for Allison Nordstrom for her insights and support. Uh, and she lives just down the street now uh, from me in Cambridge. 
So I just want to say a couple notes. Um, since you last invited me uh, in 2016, I have finished my dissertation. This is drawn from my dissertation. For those of you who attended my talk last time, there will be some repetition in part because um, I have to introduce the Kodak picture spot to everyone. And um, this is the dissertation So you see here. If you, you're interested, you can read it online. Um, and, and also I wanted to make a note about uh, the captions. You'll see that I have extensive captions in here. Normally I don't do that. Uh, I do this in part because this is being recorded and I'm dealing with several corporate archives. So I just wanted to make sure that everything was taken care of. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just a few more thank yous. Um, as, I, as Nick mentioned, this is in conjunction with an exhibition and I'm, the first image I'm going to show you is actually in this vitrine right here and I want to take a extend a personal thank you uh, to uh, Todd Gustafson as well as Jamie Allen um, and in particular Jesse Pierce and Kathy Connor who uh, let me camp out and upstairs of their archives uh, for a long time uh, and it was very much needed and appreciated. And also, as I mentioned, I have a personal history with this. I'm a product of a Kodak family, and I'd like to take a second to thank my father, pictured down here, who is, should be uh, uh, actually tuning in. Many of you who um, are from Kodak uh, know of him as Gordy Brown, not Gordon. And uh, in, in many ways, I think this just sort of seeped into my psyche over the years. We had a dark room in the basement and um, I've always been interested in how we're taught to look and see and picture the landscape. Um, so with that, uh, thank yous to also former Kodak employees, uh, the York Public Library where I also researched and the Queens Museum. Uh, if you wanna see a complete list of thank yous, you can again, look at my dissertation. So let's go ahead and begin our adventure. Oops, there we go. In 1921, a picture and a poem appeared in the Kodakery, which at the time catered to amateur photographers. The image, which would be used in several advertisements of the time, depicted a road excursion and a full car. One woman sits in the back with camera ready and a man behind the wheel gestures emphatically at the sight of a sign that reads, picture ahead, Kodak as you go. The ode went as such. No matter how far you have traveled or the scenes you have snapped by the way there is always the lure of the picture that is still to be taken someday and the zest of the chase never lessens though miles upon miles you have sped there is always some new view awaiting there is always a picture ahead i'm cool Fast forward over 80 years later, when posting a digital image to the website Flickr in 2006, a 21st century amateur photographer noted the proliferation of signs on Pier 39 in San Francisco. Quote, no longer do you need an eye for composition, he said. Kodak has taken care of everything. The only thing you need to do is hold the, hold the camera and smoosh the button down. Postcard picture guaranteed, unquote. Taking the motto as a command, he proceeded to collect and then share all 10 scenic locations presented by Kodak along the wharf, remarking that this brought back memories of his first trip to Disney World. Since their inception circa 1921, these iconic picture-taking signs have operated in the social sphere, encouraging photographic emulation and dissemination. It is my contention that the branding and use of Kodak picture spots when mapped onto and into the American landscape illustrates and promotes a vernacular and corporate version of free photography, as well as an expanded notion of a vernacular and corporate version of what Jamie Allen has called the established view. And social media theorist, Nathan Jurgensen has called conspicuous photography. Connected to conspicuous consumption, this is a set of photographic expectations, actions, and entities that tied to corporate culture and commercial technology, which are observed, enacted, and reified. When shooting at these picture-taking signs, much like using a selfie stick, a camera platform, or other accoutrement, I also believe that practitioners also enact in part what scholar 
media scholar uh, Ariella Uzule has called the event of photography, a relational encounter which includes spectators and in which a photograph is only one possible outcome. Photographs created at these signs can be latent via the possibility of encouraged images or hypothetical pictures implanted in our mind's eye or corporeal by way of a comparative print on the sign itself or an image kept as proof later of being there. This presentation gives a brief overview of the history and meaning of the Kodak picture spot, including its earliest instances as roadside signs, installations within World's Fairs and Disney parks, and later cultural, social, and artistic responses. Introduced during the machine age, picture spots encouraged mediated sightseeing to spur photographic activity, sell more product, and by extension, the landscape is a visual commodity. Few scholars address these touristic devices or situate them within the broader visual or material culture of the 20th century America. Via a consideration of corporate controlled vision and its associated images, real and ideal, I observed that the sign's emphasis also vacillates from the promotion of potential pictures to shareable experiences along with their locations. Whereas the signs were originally planted across America, they found their natural habitat in the Disney landscape and now resonate with nostalgia. The attendant photographs fall into several categories as seen here, ranging from the depiction of the vista or the monument alone, the view with the sign included, and people posing with the signs themselves. In this talk, I highlight such shared images meant to resemble each other and be distinctly individual, but also draw attention to the sharing of photographic behaviors in public spaces. Given Kodak's de declaration of bankruptcy in 2012 and new forms of digital and social media, an examination of this topic at this time is, continues to be both essential and apt. Recommended views have a long history. In the 18th century, British tourists went in search of vistas that reminded them of paintings or prints. Stations based upon picturesque locations mentioned by writers such as Th Thomas West, William Gil Gilpin and others were mapped and some even became actual structures as seen in Clay Station in England's Lake District in the upper right. Armed with optical accoutrements and tinted mirrors such as Claude Lorraine glasses, tourists followed in others' footsteps to display their aesthetic erudition. And I just wanna make a, a note about the image at the lower right. Uh, I actually started this journey at University of Texas at Austin in a seminar paper uh, for the picturesque era. And my father very kindly went, uh, contacted Grant Romer uh, at the Eastman Museum and asked to see a Claude Lorraine glass. And that's what you're seeing here. It's a black tinted mirror concave. Uh, that sort of makes everything darker and pulls it in um, much like a picture and he's demonstrating it in, in the hallway here. Most notably, while these images could not yet be made permanent, this activity was a public form of behavioral sharing. Later sightseers who happen upon a picture spot sign or those gathered there probably feel a similar sense of comfort as their pre-photographic ancestors, the potential prospect is confirmed by their very presence. Sensing an opportunity in the early 20th century, Kodak yoked together two technological pleasures that were rapidly growing, driving and photographing. Bridging the New Deal and the post-war boom eras, the road signs and new behaviors trafficked and discourses of progress, technology, automobile culture, and national tourism. Like train cars, the automobile windshield became another device to show and stage the American landscape. Beginning in 1907, Kodak featured cars in their ads, often with windows acting as frames, and later released a guidebook with tips for capturing the landscape. Very often, Kodak's taglines emphasized experience and possibility. A 1920s Kodak ad seen here took this a step further touting latent images and potential perfect pictures already located within the landscape in its ad copy. Quote, wherever the call of the road leads you, there you will find pictures, untaken pictures that invite your Kodak, unquote. 
Likely spearheaded by Kodak advertising executive Louis Bennell Jones, the first phase of the picture taking sign campaign used one of the company's popular print slogans, Kodak as you go, adding the exclamation picture head. Between 1920 and 1925, it is estimated that Kodak placed about 5,000 metal signs across the country's burgeoning road system, and salesmen were encouraged to coordinate their window displays with such themes. As a former newspaper man, L.B. Jones certainly knew copy and was known for his flair for light verse. Starting as an advertising manager in 1892, only four years after Kodak began, Jones was promoted to vice president in charge of sales and advertising in 1921. His tenure at Kodak lasted until his death in 1934. Pictured here is Doc Caskell, described as from the advertising department, installing a sign on the side of the road, as well as the only known extant metal sign that I could find. And just an aside here, this is in the collection of Charlie Cameraman, very apt last name. Uh, and this was pictured, uh, he got the sign and this image of uh, Doc Caskell installing it, um, I believe on eBay or an auction site. So if anybody, knows of one of these perhaps uh, that is in your barn or has seen one, please let me know. A map of the distribution of these picture head signs is either not accessible or extant, but a few period articles do mention some strategic and general locations, including Mount Shasta in California, the Columbia Highway above Portland, highways throughout the South and West, and even the Berkshire Hills in Massachusetts. Kodak's picture had signs aptly began in the Rochester, New York era, as you can see on the right. It's seen in two examples from a Rochester Herald Sunday Magazine 1925 article. Although the resultant images are too poorly reproduced to identify specifically, both demonstrate picturesque principles, accepted compositional practices, and certainly would please an average Kodak customer. While promoting plentiful pictures was their ultimate aim, such as seen in this 1923 window display on the left, urging every road leads to pictures, with a post pointing in multiple directions, the Kodak signs might not always be in the most photogenic surroundings or feasible locations, as you can see on the right. The exact locales most likely had to be negotiated with landowners, um, resulting in situations as seen, uh, which accompanied another of Doc Haskell's adventures in the Kodak magazine, seen at, bo at bottom. Uh, as seen in another example from the journal Automobilier, employees did not always place the signs in the most aesthetic or practical locations, such as against a fence or with no easily identifiable prospect, sometimes puzzling literal-minded travelers. To counteract this confusion, circa 1925, Kodak reportedly replaced all of the signs with alternate wording. There's always a picture ahead, Kodak. The small yet significant change in phrasing commands even more attention and action and implies that one must always be ready to photograph. With the rise of travel and roads, there was a concomitant growth in outdoor advertising in the 1920s. Picture spots immediately hit a cultural nerve and were referenced in everything from church sermons to Upton, Upton Sinclair's novel, Oil, to a 1922 poem that lamented, quote, I had fun pretended to myself that every view I seen belonged to me, unquote, and ending with the call, machinery, machinery, picture ahead. Geographers John Jacob and Keith Scully remind us that, quote, places are centers of behavioral expectations, and such signs told tourists how to perform within the built environment. In the 1920s, groups such as the National Council for Roadside Beauty formed to combat what they saw as a visual assault on the land. Contrary to such visual pollution, as seen in this period cartoon on the right, Kodak's markers were probably seen as good signs. Instead of obscuring scenes, they pointed them out. Akin to, akin to the well-known sequential Burmese roadside signs, which actually come, came five years after Codex, the picture ahead markers were also sparked humor and creativity. In a 1921 cartoon from New Era, for example, a motorist speeds along 
a highway while the commentary and by proxy Kodak commands him to follow its orders, despite placing the photo photographer close to the side of a cliff or on a perilous curve. Quote, you've nothing to fear following the instructions, no matter how queer. The pictures you'll get will all be grand. You mustn't worry about where you might land, unquote. A window display from a Springfield, Missouri fo photo supply store titled Kodak Filling Station, as seen on the right, was a prize winning entry for July 1921. Here, Kodak cameras stand in for automobiles and film cartridges for gas pumps with a shutter release serving as the hose. A Kodak Girl ad acts as a backdrop, let's see it right here, and two small signs bear the phrases associated with picture taking signs, picture ahead and in the plural, more likely to connote abundance and Kodak as you go. The Kodak picture spot is just one of many devices defined broadly that taught and still teach the public how to see and behave photographically within the landscape. As seen in these more modern fine art photographs by Roger Minnick and R Raymond Derpardon, a scenic overlook invites a familiar visual encounter and one that is subtly or not so subtly crafted for commodified viewing and conspicuous consumption. Critic Lucy Lepard are, observes that selective vantage points require little work. Quote, the view or scenic overlook is a ready-made photograph waiting to be snapped. Just as the postcard is a substitute for first photography, the scenic overlook is a substitute for exertion, unquote. Taken further, I would categorize picture spots and their associated images as second photography, what soci sociologists term public photography. Akin to the self-conscious act of taking a selfie, the signs become locations for photographic behaviors to be witnessed and emulated. In the end, we may not even take the picture, even if we do press the button. We acquire and now immediately share standardized, corporate approved images at the places pictured. Oops. Kodak was not the only company to subsidize photographic maps, markers, or experiences within the larger landscape or Disney parks. Fujifilm is the sponsor of Tokyo Disneyland, and generic spots, as seen on the right, reveal just how omnipresent and ingrained Kodak's visual training has become. When Disney World in Florida opened in 1971, GAF, GAF, General Analyne and Film, supplanted Kodak as the sponsor for both parks. In 1972, in addition to a store, GAF created a photo trail map you see in the middle for Disneyland, along with 24 signs, conveniently the number of frames on a regular roll of film. Beginning in 1979, as seen on the right, Polaroid issued maps together with a camera browsing program, but no associated signs, as far as I can tell, until 1982 when Kodak returned as the official sponsor when Epcot opened. In order to understand the picture spot more broadly, it is helpful to chart the shared histories and goals of these two companies. Both Kodak and Disney drew inspiration from and contributed to world's fairs and expositions. Originally, all photography was prohibited during Chicago's World Fair of 1893, also known as the Columbian Exposition. The goal was to curtail the use of amateur photography, as Nancy Martha West explains, quote, in order to ensure that visitors would purchase their photographs instead, unquote. Not one to take no for an answer, George Eastman himself petitioned the fair and Kodak set up shop next to the official Department of Photography encouraging visitors to share amply and bring the fair home on just one roll, the company sold a special Columbus camera uh, with Ks <laughs> uh, with 250 exposures instead of the normal 100. Just as Disney would later do with television, the official photographs pre-sold the fair experience. Walking tours appeared in popular journals and Kodak shared guidebooks, both showcasing, as historian Eric Gordon states, quote, the best vantage points from which to photograph in the service of reproducing Charles Dudley Arnold's official images, unquote. And you can see a comparison, the official image at the top, and then an image of him capturing some amateurs taking virtually the same picture below. 
Such formal images and maps, I suggest, presage the protocol for the Kodak picture spots. The first Kodak picture taking sign with an exposition environment was not, was not for taking pictures, but was included as a part of a display in a regional affair. The 1922 Rochester Industrial Exposition at Exposition Park, now Edgerton, at Edgerton Park. Kodak presented their wares in a self-described rustic booth seen here, overseen by the advertising service and shipping departments. The design of the booth recalled a roadside stand with foliage wrapped around wooden fences and two rustic style benches flanking the sides. But this fair, like many others, was an urban experience. Notably, this small booth essentially contained all of the elements that would later become key features of Kodak's World's Fair and later Disney's strategy. A display space dedicated to the company and its wares, opportunities to educate aesthetically and technically, signs or spaces indicating picture-taking opportunities or connected to a larger campaign, and finally presence of idealized sample images in the form of the frame photographs displayed at the back. So you can see here is one of the signs here to the right, and then this is sort of a display case for selling and demonstrating, and then the sample images at the back, possibly actually taken at Kodak picture spots. In order to, re to create Disneyland, Walt Disney drew upon several factors, his fascination with world fairs, trains, and miniatures. Likely inspired by the media surrounding the 1939-40 New York World Fair, Disney attended other expositions as research. In addition to the nearby Knott's Berry Farm amusement area, these efforts served as inspiration for Disney's many parks, including California, Florida, Tokyo, Paris, and this year, the new, uh, and actually recently, the new uh, park in Shanghai, China. Disneyland's heart shaped peripheral berm, as you can see um, pictured in the blue as well as the aerial photograph below, uh, was a mounded area blocking out transportation and parking lots, would be repeated in every park uh, since. As Disney wrote on the occasion of Disneyland's opening, quote, I don't want the public to see the world they live in while they're in the park. I want them to feel as if they are in another world, unquote. Like the Kodak picture spots, the berms function as visual presentation and editing devices. The American public witnessed Disneyland as it was being built via a series of television specials, which helped to raise awareness and equate Disney with its landscape. As architectural historian Sandy Eisenstadt has observed, the mid-century house had three views, the TV, the fireplace, and the landscape through a picture window. The perfect complement to a home designed for visual recreation, the television, like the camera, allowed for frame viewing, the acquisition of images, and the projection of travel. In 1959, Disney produced another television special on the occasion of the opening of the monorail, submarine, and Matterhorn, and featured Kodak ads as well as Kodak picture spots in their actual um, advertising. And you can see here, this is actually Art Link Letter, and this is um, a video uh, piece that they did. Standing inside of the Kodak store, host Art Link Letter pointed to a sign and proclaimed, pictures and Disneyland just naturally go together. With the addition of these new features to the California park, Kodak picture-taking signs officially entered the Disney landscape. Disney tested the waters for an East Coast Disneyland by designing several attractions at the 1964-65 New York World Fair. On the heels of Disneyland, would be the best advertising money couldn't buy. The signs were only agreed to in 1963 with much back and forth with fair officials and planner Robert Moses himself, delaying their installation until spring 1964, close to the time the fair opened to the public in late April. Kodak and their ad agency in effect tried to sell the 1964 New York World's Fair on selling film, which would then turn sell the fair itself. 
In their booklet, they both looked to Disney to confirm their claims regarding picture taking signs, which, um, which were only implemented one year earlier uh, in Disneyland, but perhaps more inter inter interestingly, they also turned to roadside and scenic do-it-yourself regional attractions. And I want to just point out, this was the original uh, proposed design for the picture spot uh, at the New York World's Fair in 64, which was uh, summarily voted down uh, just because uh, this would block a lot of different things. They, uh, in the pitch book that you can see in the middle here, they actually showed how they works at Disneyland. And you can see this is, um, they say the sign tells the visitor where to stand and how to shoot to get the best picture of the Mississippi steamboat coming around the bend. And then they show the resulting picture, which as you can see is very visually pleasing. Uh, a consumer would be very happy with this uh, and buy more film and in turn show it to their family back home which would then encourage them to go to the fair. Um, I also want to point out here, uh, this is what they look like. Uh, this is from the New York uh, Public Library, uh, a, a, a heated argument back and forth with one particular pavilion, uh, the Simmons Pavilion, uh, Mattress Pavilion. Here, they were worried that they weren't photographing the, the images as they liked. And this is the actual fair logo, not a photograph. But as you can see here, it also included extensive uh, exposure information for various different films. Okay. Uh, let's see, the chat just came up. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay. Okay. Officials only agreed to the signs uh, after Kodak consented to produce mur murals for the Pan American Highway Gardens, which encircled their pavilion and celebrated the new thoroughfare, which had just opened, sort of uh, uniting North and South America. Um, I do want to say that you can see it here in the background uh, that this is it's here. And they originally had um, artifacts, uh, like Mayan artifacts and the like, displayed as well as these murals and these are the ones that Kodak agreed to make in exchange for the Kodak picture spots basically. This is the Kodak pavilion you can see it with their large um, display which were huge images that you could see for many miles uh, at night and you can see that in the background here. I do want to note that that notice that that actually does not say Kodak on here but they are Kodak colors. Uh, Robert Moses and the fair did not want them to say Kodak on the actual main part of the sign. Obviously, they did down here when they listed the films. On top of the moon-like roof deck and at every sign, uh, Kodak promoted picture taking as a public activity and shared behavior. And I, this is the Kodak Pavilion. This is the top of it, actually. And this is what was called the moon deck. It was an undulating surface that people could walk uh, up on a round, so in this elevated point of view, they can see even more of the fair, encouraging more photographs and vistas to be uh, sort of taken in. They also did do some signage on the top, encouraging people to take sort of signage for their slideshows as well as home movies. To my knowledge, they did not have Kodak picture spot signs up there, but they did have signs um, telling people where to take pictures. In addition to this instructive feature, Kodak also produced a brochure, which included reference to the Kodak picture spots, reproducing a small stylized sign and the following text reading in part. Watch for these signs as you tour the fair. From such spots or nearby, you will find scenes worth photographing. Each sign gives the camera settings for snapshots and movies. Coda color prints show nearby pictures that you can take. Naturally, not all can be marked. And here are a few other ones here. That's what I was reading from at the top from their brochure. This is at the New York Pavilion that if some of you have uh, watched Men in Black will recognize. Um, it's unfortunately sort of like a ruin today. And this is at the African uh, Pavilion down here. And you can see here, these are actual, as they noted, they are actual prints that they would have to actually sub out at some point uh, because they would fade in the sun. Pattern after the Disneyland signs and Kodak colors yet lacking their logo, the multinational company installed approximately 25 signs the first season and possibly up to 25 the next. 
And you can see here, this is the Kodak Pavilion right here, circled in red. Um, and they're actually notated here uh, with a yellow sort of uh, rectangle with PS in the middle. This uh, map is an annotated map. It was not on the actual map. This uh, a bulletin board of World Fair enthusiasts went through their cadre of vernacular slides and prints to try to identify the location of many of these as they possibly could. And as you can see here, they actually found, um, this is one here, this is the picture spot sign uh, where you would stand. And this is the resulting photograph of the Sinclair dinosaur uh, that you would, uh, you would uh, produce, which again is a very nice, nice looking photograph. The black camera icon next to the phrase picture spot did not reflect Kodak's fair issued offering or their new, then new Kodak Instamatic camera. Quite interestingly, the graphic chosen for the fair signs was a bellows type camera closer to those available during the Columbian exposition. Instead of reflecting the future forward theme of the fair or the streamlined look of the sign, Kodak chose or the fair possibly chose instead uh, to emphasize photographic history on the picture spot sign. The site and site of a Kodak picture spot sign at the 1964 New York World's Fair likely not only conjured up memories of earlier cameras and roadside signs, but underscored Kodak's legacy within international expositions. With the encouragement of Robert Moses, the fair's master planner, Disney purchased land in Florida in 1965. Originally known as Project X, Disney World was supposed to be Disneyland the way it ought to have been built and include his experiment in urban planning. Disney died in 1966, however, and his utopian experiment became the Epcot theme park instead, which opened in 1982. Essentially a permanent World's Fair, Epcot allows visitors to travel via corporate and international pavilions uh, surrounding the lake. The Kodak complex emphasized imagination and housed several areas into 2010 when they ceased their sponsorship. Not surprisingly, Epcot has consistently boasted the most Kodak picture spot signs of any American park, whether it was 13 in 1982 or 11 in 2009. And you can see them marked there um, on the right. Whether at Disney or elsewhere, the text of Kodak signs has varied over the years, shifting more recently to emphasize, emphasizing encounters and memories. An Epcot sign from the 1980s, for example, is seen on the left, underscored narrative proclaiming this location recommended by top photographers to help you tell the story of your visit and pictures. While another later sign in the animal kingdom encouraged a trip not taken, when it stated, remember your trip to Asia. Instructed by the markers, image makers do what they are told, reifying constructed views and experiences. As seen in examples of this type, the physicality of the signs likewise invites bodily interaction and amusement. The act of photographing becomes a shared social experience as well as one worthy of being photographed in and of itself. Turning more specifically to the sign's actual graphic design, Kodak Disney signs from the 1950s and 60s featured a stylized flag, which as you can see in the middle, or the silhouette of a man with a camera, as you can see on the right, while the 1980s on the left shifted to an abstracted person. In Disneyland Paris, by contrast, the spots are called point photos, underscoring their locative nature. More recent designs of Disney markers mirror the particular landscape that they highlight and are generally more fanciful. While present day signs feature not only one comparative image per location, 1964 World's Fair and early Disneyland picture spots showcase three or more sample photographs along with specific exposure information. And I do want to point out that I was luckily able to meet um, actually the person that photographed most of these, uh, Kodak employee Paul Yaros. He was involved in this from 1960 on. Um, and, you know, some spots were already chosen. Perhaps he also helps um, select ones that he chose himself. He would also take other images because they would have to reproduce more uh, to then uh, swap out the actual photographs in the signs themselves. 
Later, in order to outfit the frames, the protocol was very specific, according to Disney and Disney spokespeople. Disney photographers capture a variety of images and submitted them to Kodak, who then selected the final examples. Today, notably, most digital cameras and phones lack viewfinders, encouraging a more direct comparison of the display screen with the depicted sample photograph. Indeed, Disney parks almost seem designed for photography. The similarity of pictures taken at the same Kodak sign underscores this, even when there's many, many years in between them, with the results often featuring centered subjects and picturesque framing trees, um, and also centered subjects, as you can see here, in front of this uh, stone wall. The castle is, in fact, what Disney called a weenie, lowering the eyes and functioning like a long shot in film. Remarking on the sometimes surreal solitude of the resulting images, art historian David Doris has observed, quote, this visual sleight of hand is often accomplished by the strategic placement of the picture spot markers against a barrier or fence, unquote, which you can see here. John Hench, one of the head Disney Imagineers, explained another feature, quote, hubs open essentially circular spaces that afford views in many directions, facilitate decision-making, unquote. Indeed, many picture spot signs frame weenies or exist with near or within hubs, as a Disney representative later explained to me, quote, the locations were chosen based on park icons, the castle, spaceship Earth, etc., and key landscape areas around the lake at Epcot, for example, the best spots to get the icon in the pecs, unquote. Maps are other visual devices uh, defined broadly used within the Disneyland landscape. Kodak has sponsored and print, printed all US Disney maps, save the previ previously mentioned hiatus until 2012. As seen in this interior shot from the Kodak store at Disneyland on the left, early um, a park map hung above the sales counter equating places, pictures, and prices. And I'd like to point out, actually, you can, it's even more yoked to, to that because as you can see here, there's a ribbon that goes uh, from the actual place designated on the map and this has been cut off, but these are actual photographs or images um, in sort of frame-like uh, sort of devices on the side here. So they're literally connecting them. Okay, where was I? Furthermore, early Disney maps, like signs, initially provided a plethora of photographic information. The 1956 Disneyland Kodak camera tour guide, for example, at the upper right, reproduced sample photographs complete with tips and extensive camera settings for various films, which were replicated in the 1950s and 1960s picture spots. In what may be called nostalgia tourism, later enthusiasts often make pilgrimages to the same Kodak sign or attempt to locate old photographs in the parks with the help of Google Maps and crowdsourcing. In this vernacular form of re-photography, picture spot markers are designations to be located, visited, photographed, and shared repeatedly. Kodak picture-taking signs began to enter the larger American landscapes almost immediately after seeing success in Disneyland in 1959 and the World's Fair in 1964. In 1960, for example, Kodak proposed installing 150 picture spot signs at the Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley, California, and another series in Freedom Land, an amusement park in the Bronx, although it is unclear if these efforts came to pass. In 1967, Kodak offered its dealers a generic picture spot in red, yellow, and black with hanging brackets for $5, as you can see on the left, encouraging them to create their own locales and trails. Quote, wherever there's a scenic view worth recording for posterity, there ought to be a Kodak picture spot sign, unquote. Other locales that adopted these latter-day picture-taking signs included intrepid store owners in regional amusement parks, such as the Enchanted Forest in Old Forge, New York, and Fentier Village in Salamanca, New York, which boasted, quote, the most incredible view east of the Mississippi. Likewise, Kodak pushed their sign campaign farther afield, installing them at smaller international fairs, 
such as seen here at Hemisphere uh, 68 in San Antonio, the 1982 World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee, the 1984 World's Exposition in New Orleans, Louisiana, and later the LA and San Diego zoos, as you can see at the top. Before Disney Empire expanded and eclipsed others, Kodak very much succeeded in replanting picture spots across roadside America. While it is not clear if Kodak picture spots entered into national and state parks in an official capacity as early as the 1920s, the photographic giant did begin a general picture taking campaign in the mid 50s and late 60s. Kodak crafted a significant marketing push leading up to the centennial of the founding of the first national park, Yellowstone, in 1872, which preceded the creation of the National Park Service. Kodak's efforts in parks seemed to vary greatly, resulting more often in guided photo excursions denoted by marked maps than actual physical signs. As noted on an early black and white trifold brochure from 1967 for Yosemite seen on the right, with a more aligned title of picture taking spots, this map was quote, prepared as a public service for Yosemite National Park by Eastman Kodak Company, underscoring the company as generous public benefactor. Inside two numbered and ordered routes are accompanied by a few small sample photographs. 19 different spots are marked as well as 11 specific points of view denoted by arrows. Later pamphlets from the 70s and the 80s scale up the imagery to mark demarcating even more picture taking spots and including even more model photographs. At least one park, local park, included actual picture taking spot signs along with their map. And while it is not a national park, it is in Rochester's backyard, Letchworth State Park. The photograph uh, for this particular brochure from 1967 is seen on the left as long as with those for many other national parks and natural areas and Disney were taken by Kodak employee Paul Yeros. As with other parks, this Kodak effort provided tips for the best pictures, such as ask someone to pose in the foreground and look into the scene, frame the scene using objects such as a tree branch or rock formation, and above all, include reference to the sign themselves by making the title pictures by photographing signs, include people looking or pointing at title signs, unquote, and that's from the map. The photograph found in Flickr, as you can see on the right, appears to showcase the rugged Lutchworth signs at an overlook, along with another viewing device, a tower coin operated binocular viewer. As picture spots are no longer maintained in the broader American landscape, it's necessary to return to Disney to bring their legacy up to the present day. In 2012, there were approximately 35 Kodak picture spot signs scattered across the main five main Disney US parks, with Epcot featuring the most signs at 11 and Hollywood Studios the fewest with four. Today, there are 15 picture spots scattered across all of the parks, with Epcot featuring the most at eight and Animal Kingdom the fewest at only one. In 1963, by contrast, in the upper left, there were over 30 photo spot signs in Disneyland alone. Projecting a photographic bounding made sense at mid-century. The more pictures taken, the more films sold, the more images printed, and so forth. Over time, the number of signs have de decreased, while the photographic services offered the parks have increased and shifted from stores and film changing stations to kiosks for printing, downloading, and sharing. And now all of this is moved completely online. Launched in 2004, Disney started to take photography into its own hands through a program called PhotoPass, which continues to this day. To participate, you hand your free pass card to a photographer to scan, and as Disney explains, quote, you can find photographers at the park entrances, main icons, and at many of your favorite Disney character meet and greet locations, unquote. Start with a classic on Main Street and let our photographers point out other perfect spots, unquote. In essence, the roving photographers, I believe, have become Kodak picture spots. Their very presence signals a good picture. Interested parties can purchase digital access prints or a variety of printed souvenirs, but now downloading is now the preferred method. The ability to picture now mainly resides with the professional, 
and Disney itself, while sharing sits within the amateur's purview, directed and still branded with hashtags and Instagram symbols. Oops. Nikon uh, took over Disney's photographic sponsorship in November 2013, as you can see here in the middle on the left, and later installed their own signs, which were visually similar to Kodak's. Just in the last month, in late September, early October 2021, Nikon quietly entered their sponsorship of Disney and with it, picture taking signs. By this move and with this move, Disney has fully taken over photography and its image within the parks. They have rebranded the signs as photo pass photo spots that you can see here, presumably to rhyme with Disney's photo pass program and photographers. As the Disney website explained under the heading model behavior, quote, set up your shot like a pro by finding a sample photo under each picture spot sign. Whether you want to pose like a Disney princess or get as silly as goofy, make your way to a picture spot and take your best shot, unquote. And as you can see, they've slightly changed the name of it as well. No longer is it a picture spot, it's actually photo spot. So a lot of the things online and I would assume at the parks themselves is in transition. For better or worse, Disney's taking over of its own picture taking and by extension image signals a mission accomplished. Kodak successfully encouraged photographic activity, perhaps to its own detriment. By way of bringing our whirlwind to tour to an end, and we're almost there. Uh, I will briefly uh, highlight several contemporary projects that resonate with these iconic objects and return at the end to the road where we began. In 1968, the Canadian collective N.E. Thing Company Limited, as seen in the top, installed signs informing cars that they were entering their fictitious company's landscape and where and when to start and stop viewing. During one installation of their appropriated highway vista, they even received inquiries from actual real, real estate firms, further underscoring the institutional qualities of the piece. At the, lower, at the bottom, you can see co-published by the Center for Land Use Interpretation or CLUI, the artist book suggested photo spots develops these ideas even further. Initiated in 1998 as a site extrapolation project, Suggested Photos is a panoramic spiral bound book by artists Melinda Stone and Igor Bamos. Via 20 collaged maps images, uh, which double as postcards that you can send, readers are treated to anti-Kodak picture spots, including a border crossing fence and even Kodak's own wastewater treatment plant. Next, the camera restricta is a prototype camera by German artist Philip Schmidt, which uses GPS metadata culled from image sharing websites to determine if a location is too popular photographically. As Wired Magazine explains, quote, if it identifies more than 35 photos taken at a given location, basically 115 feet in any direction, the camera's shutter re retracts and blocks the viewfinder so you can't take the photo, unquote. And as you can see here, it says nine. <laughs> What's more, the camera also emits a ticking sound akin to a Geiger counter when you have reached a quota, which would most certainly bar photographs taken at Kodak picture spots. By contrast, Google has a feature on Samsung phones that aggregates uh, public photographs taken at the same place and boasts an option to explore your own images on a map in their Google Photos application. Seen in a positive light, this tethering of the photograph to reality, akin to the picture spot sign, still persists in the digital age. Seen in a negative light, this yoking of the image to a precise location via GPS coordinates or hashtagging can lead to uh, notions of surveillance or popular landscape features and vantage points being loved to death. Both efforts call to mind an assertion by Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, and Steven Eisenhower in learning from Las Vegas, quote, if you take the signs away, there is no place, unquote. Museums are generally less critical than artists when referencing picture spot signs or similar practices. As a part of their 2016 exhibition, Photography in America's National Parks, the George Eastman Museum seen at the upper left 
set up various backdrops and signs to encourage interaction within the gallery and surrounding spaces. In the last several years, the customarily photographed adverse Isabella Stewart um, Gardner Museum in Boston began to encourage picture taking, especially of its courtyard garden. In addition to camera icons and a locative hashtag is seen in the green sign on the right, um, the, the text on one marker recalls the wording of Kodak, quote, picture yourself here. It's an incredible place to take a photograph, unquote. Just outside of Boston, the de Cordova Sculpture Park and museum you can see at the bottom also installed several wooden signs on their grounds to encourage picture taking. While their rooftop, while on their rooftop terrace, one Instagrammer seemed to suggest that this instructed action, inspired initially by Kodak, of course, was internalized by now and became almost automatic when they proclaimed, quote, I felt coerced by into taking this picture by this sign, unquote. Bringing us back to circa 1921, back to the road, a gas station in Rochester recently requested the use of the advertising image with which I began this talk, and that it's featured in the current exhibition at the museum. Built near the former site of Kodak's color processing and print facilities, Fast Track features several photographs from Kodak's history uh, displayed in their cafe. You can see this is the image up here, and this is the image. You can go visit it. It's on uh, Ridge Road West uh, to see it and, and thank them for doing this. Um, here and now, in an interesting twist, a customer could take a break from driving and gaze upon a reproduction of the very first Kodak picture taking sign, which very well may have raced a nearby locale in the 1920s. Indeed, Due to, their very, uh, due to their once near ubiquity, picture spot signs have developed into nostalgic objects to be recreated, uh, displayed, and tourist destinations unto themselves. When tourists document or view the view or pose with the signs, as I have argued, they display and distribute the act of photographing. These events, both choreographed and conspicuous, occur in situ as well as later online via Flickr, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Whether they are still found along an actual road or now on the information superhighway, picture spot signs, signs grounded as they were and are to actual locations and their attendant pre-selected pictures continue to speak to the various attempts by Kodak, Disney, and others to assure a satisfying picture and thus a satisfied customer while still offering some comfort in the face of image proliferation. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, that was amazing. I uh, always enjoy hearing you talk about this and great seeing some of the updated stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about the slide you have up right now? Sure, uh, this is uh, in an image that I found on Flickr. And as you can imagine, since I'm dealing with a lot of um, vernacular images, I'm either finding them, you know, by literally going page by page through some things or slideshow by slideshow. Um, I'm also dealing with a lot of sites, uh, image sharing sites where people individually share their collections. And this is one I found on Flickr. Uh, I, it says it's from 1922, but I believe it's, around circa 1925 because it actually uh, showcases the later uh, sign verbiage. You can see there's always a picture had Kodak. And this is actually a, a photo fishing em envelope. And, and I just love it. You can see that these are supposed to sort of stand in for the cars and they're sort of filling up with film and, and prints. Um, and then they're gonna go on their merry way and take a, a beautiful picture, perhaps at a Kodak picture spot sign. Uh, I really love this. I would <laughs> too. love to get my hands on one of these. Uh, yeah. uh, so we do have a, a little bit of time for some questions. Okay. If, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free. The Q&A function is open. I do want to just note, uh, and we got a great comment that came in through the chat. Um, and I, I just want to read that to you. Uh, Leslie's dad, Gordy, was a Kodak ambassador years ago. He visited my classroom with a lesson on digital imaging and donated a Kodak digital camera for our yearbook program. Thanks, Gordy. 
That's that's right. <laughs> I really love seeing that, and I I I think this the online platform is kind of an interesting way to yeah change that have that like that story kind of go on. Um, so I uh, th this uh, there's so much to unpack from from mm -hmm. uh, obviously your your uh, a wealth of, of knowledge and, and research and you're, you know, a couple inches thick there at like <laughs> uh, dissertation. Um, how, like, what, in, in terms of like tourism and photography, um, were there any uh, particular books that you found helpful uh, in, in your research? Uh, I know it's something I'm particularly interested in myself and I and, uh, didn't know. That's right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, it is it's a challenge. I mean, as you can see, my, my approach and my dissertation is, is not a typical art history or photo history um, approach. It's, it's more visual and material culture. I also leaned a lot in sociologists uh, who are studying these kinds of things. The one that comes to mind off the top of my head that's just a good overview of, of sort of roadside photography is Aperture's recent, um, I actually kind of have it somewhere. It's a very big orange tome of sort of the roadside uh, photography and sort of that goes over the whole gamut uh, from vernacular images to fine art images as well. That's the one that comes to mind off the top. Do you do, you do private consultations on research work? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I do do freelance things like freelance curating, and I'm, I'm hoping to maybe do some consulting and the like. But I do do, I mean, I've written some in introductions and whatnot for books um, and things like that. I also teach um, as well. Yeah. Um, if somebody wanted to get a hold of, you oh uh, you've got your email right there. There on the screen. <laughs> um i believe your dad has his hand up he does okay uh, dad would you <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, want to share anything because he he actually was involved in some of the selection of these locales as well as i, I just committed talking gordon dad um you can unmute yourself hi let me see yeah yeah, you don't can. have to turn your video on. You can just talk. We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what, what do you want to talk about? Oh, anything. You had your hand up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe he was just waving okay. to say hello. Do you want to share any particular um, story about Kodak Picture Spots? I know you had the image what, that I showed at the beginning was from Universal Studios. Yeah, it uh, is. As you know, Leslie, uh, I uh, when I, I left Kodak, I was a coordinator of uh, photographic worldwide photographic uh, education for Kodak, and went all over the world. And uh, then I retired. I took one of those early retirement things. And uh, after that, they approached me. As, uh, there was a program called Kodak Ambassador Program. And it was uh, partnered after the Disney ambassadors who used to go around and proselytize about Disney. And a fellow named uh, Charlie Fisher, unfortunately, who passed away, uh, started that up. And we had 34 people. And they were all people who were either uh, teaching photography or were salespeople or something like that. And, and we went <laughs> all over the country teaching photography and they paid us $6.10 an hour, which at that time was a uh, minimum wage and paid for a hotel and our uh, transportation. So for us, it was fantastic. And uh, they always said, well, you can add a couple, a couple of days on and take your wife with you. So we did that, you know, and uh, we had people who went down to Yosemite and taught for uh, a week and uh, some of the major uh, national parks. Uh, so uh, a lot of the fellows, and I think you met one of them, uh, Paul Yarrows, I uh -huh. uh, was in consumer information. And it was their group uh, who later on designated part, uh, 
picture spots in the parks uh -huh. that, that came later. But, uh, you know, I did some of that too. I go down, to, I spent a whole week down at uh, Disney World and uh, went around and finding a spot, finding a picture spot isn't that easy because you got to wait for the right time of day. Uh -huh. uh, hopefully there won't be 10,000 people there and that kind of thing. And uh, there'd be a clear uh, shed view so that you didn't chop somebody's shoulder off and do things like that. So uh, we took lots of pictures and decided on uh, what to have. And then, then, of course, Nikon took over later on, as you well know. Uh, but they've used our same spots, I think, because most of them were so well thought out that, you know, you knew that Mickey Mouse was going to be there at two o'clock and that kind of thing. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the only uh, thing that I used to think about as a photographer, not brought up as a picture spot type of guy, was chances are my landscapes would not be a picture spot. They would be because the picture spots were really chosen as being a postcard type of thing. And uh, this was for people who were starting out and they would start out like that and eventually graduate. So the picture spot per se wasn't a bad thing. It was a good way to get a lot of people taking a lot of photographs and later on, they could, they could uh, go as far as they wanted to it. If they stopped there, fine. If they wanted to go further, you know, talk to Ansel Adams, John, John Sexton, they could do that too. So right. we were happy. And, the, and of course the hidden, the hidden thing there was selling cameras, selling film. Most, mostly film we, that we in marketing you've heard of the razor blade theory of marketing uh -huh. you uh, give the razor away for free and you make your money on the razor blades well right. in our case it money was, on the um, film. of course with digital that was right. not a good way to go uh -huh. because the, the cost of the cost of uh, taking a picture a digital picture was zero but, but anyway, I hope I didn't take up too well, much. Well, thank time. you for sharing, Dad. And you are. Oh, it's my fun. And I'm just so proud of you, Leslie. You've done such a wonderful job. I mean, she did blood, sweat, and tears on her dissertation. And I've got, I've got an SD card. Yeah. Any SD card. It's got her whole, her whole dissertation on it. Yeah. Oh, and thanks to my advisor, Kim Sichel, who at Boston University, all the others and my readers who were through me sick and thin. So it's, it's a delight to have this all come back around. So. Well, thank you, yeah. Leslie. And thank you, Gordy, for joining us and, and sharing about your experience. And, and thank you for, I, I've got to imagine that you uh, had a pretty profound impact on, uh, on Leslie and her uh, research and interest in the, in the topic. And I'm sure we're a very helpful source. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody uh, for joining us. Um, uh, we, like I said, we did record this, so it will be available on our uh, YouTube page in about a week. So feel free to check back. Uh, Great. Thanks everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Nick.